Part of me felt like I was taking a trip, taking a little ride. So nice to hear my fellow comedians introduce me. Thank you to Matthew L. Weiss for putting that intro together. Uh, this is, you know, this is all I have left. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Ted Alexandro show. I am retired comedian Ted Alexandro. And it is, it's fun for me to hear that intro now. I was reflecting on that as, as I heard uh, each of those comedians bringing me to the stage. And uh, I miss my comedy friends. I believe in that intro, we heard John Laster, Mike Yard, Sean Donnelly, Ray Ellen, John Fish, I believe. Uh, forgive me if I'm missing anyone else. Uh, but it's nice to, it's nice to hear their voices. And, and that is actually the intro to my new special cut up. Matthew put that together. Uh, the name of the special is cut up because, well, for two reasons, the first of which is it's cut together from various shows at, uh, the village underground and also, uh, the comedy cellar and, uh, out West at helium comedy club. So uh, it's just nice to hear, it's nice to hear those voices of my, my comrades in arms. So uh, yes, it is a, a version, I, I stand corrected, it is a version of that, of that uh, introduction that you will hear in Cut Up if you have listened to the, the special. Uh, so welcome folks to episode seven of the Ted Alexandro Show coming to you live from the studio headquarters in Astoria, Queens, New York City, these United States of America. And uh, I was thinking about, about my, my fellow comedians, partially because uh, <laughs> I don't know how immersed you folks are. Uh, and of course, I do want to... Uh, not just welcome you, but welcome you to hop into our comment section on YouTube, uh, which I will be delving into. So uh, get in there, make your presence felt. Uh, do not hold back, but exercise etiquette at all times. Um, I was thinking about stand-up comedy, which I used to, uh, I used to hold a black belt in and um you know people of course uh, uh a lot of talk about stand-up comedy uh as i was saying i'm not sure how immersed you are in stand-up and in the uh the chatter around it you know because we can be a, a bit of a bubble ourselves and uh it is one of the fun things about being in comedy all of the chatter it's like the real housewives of uh you know of McDougal street or, or, <laughs> or wh wherever you happen to be, it's coast to coast. I just, I just said McDougal street because that's uh, where I practice my, that's my dojo primarily uh, when I, when I was a comedian. Um, but now as, as things are starting up in quotes and comedy is rolling out, in various forms, again, in quotes, uh, you know, I, I, I keep up with what's going on. I see what's going on uh, and I've had some offers. The offers have been rolling in despite my, my retirement, which I, uh, is in my Twitter bio. Uh, but yes, I, I just today received a text message offering me a gig in a parking lot. They paved paradise and, uh, and booked a stand-up comedy show. <laughs> I guess it's better, than a, it's better than just a... Right? I think Joni Mitchell would agree with that. 
I think if you, if you pave paradise and put up a parking lot and then book a comedy show in that parking lot, there's, I guess, Joni, can we say there's still an element of paradise? I guess it depends. It, you know, there's a lot of variables, obviously. So I've been getting these offers, you know, do you want to do a show at a drive-in? Do you want to do a show in a diner parking lot? Do you want to do a show atop a dumpster? One of those is not true. I'll allow you to discern which. It's not that important. <laughs> My answer thus far has been no. No, thank you. Us. I took <laughs> I took one year or not even I think I took a semester of Shotokan karate. My senior year of high school, St. Francis Prep in Fresh Meadows, Queens. Uh I was gonna say I was somewhat adrift. I don't know if that's true. It makes for a better segue. <laughs> I needed something to occupy my time. And I think I always had a soft spot for karate and uh, was always intrigued. So we had a karate club at St. Francis Prep. I don't, is it karate? It's always like Hawaii. It's, karate is like Hawaii to me. I never know if I'm supposed to say Hawaii. Ka karate. You know, I don't want to be like, Karate. I feel like a white guy from the 70s, which I basically am. Welcome to the Ted Alexandro show. <laughs> uh, but saying karate is funnier to me, and I always go with the funnier choice, provided I'm not insulting an entire population of people, although I'm from them. That's the whole point of the story. I took a semester of Shotokan. And it was hilarious because it was not like a team. I wasn't on the karate team at St. Francis Prep. I was in the karate club. <laughs> I was in a fight club of sorts, but we had uh, integrity. Everyone was real. And I did take some real ass whippings. I, uh, the karate club would meet in a classroom. It was, you know, there was no real funding, I don't think, we, and no space for it. So we just met in a classroom and uh, we bought our, you know, we bought our geese and our belts and all that. So it was official to that extent. And the guys that taught were good. I'm not, I'm not shitting on them. Our, you know, but we did have like white instructors and, you know, the, part of me just wants to feel in the sense that it makes it, a, for me, a white guy from the 70s, attending high school in the 80s. I feel like it's more authentic uh, if my sensei is not named Sensei Mike, a white guy from Bayside. You know, am I wrong to say that? He might kick my ass, though he, you know, like any good practitioner of the martial arts, I think most things roll off his back. So if you're watching Sensei Mike, us, I think that's what we said. I do remember counting. I think we said itch, knee, son, chi. And then uh, I was out after that. But I do remember I was in the best shape of my life when I took karate. I was a member of the karate club at St. Francis prep. Uh, I think we went from three to four thirty, maybe three days a week. I think I, honestly, this is no stretch. Cause I played for the basketball team the first two years, you know, but I went through my, uh, I went through my transformation. I was a jock in the early years. Senior year, I was in the karate club and then in the drama club. So it was like my own, like, nom. You know, like I was an anti-war protester. I grew my hair out of sorts. You know, I was still, you know, my hands were registered lethal weapons by the end of that semester. 
but I just, I have a fond recollection of studying Shotokan, which I didn't even know was a real, you know, I didn't even know that was a real, I always just thought karate, but like there's different things. There's like Shotokan and other ones <laughs> that I don't know. But man, I look back on that because I, I kind of had abs. I was kind of, I was kind of like, I look back, I could almost do a split, I think. Sensei Mike had us doing splits. I never did a split with basketball. I just like touched my toes, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I have a, it, it's almost like a dream. You ever have certain things in your life that just like, did I, did, was I really part of the, you're damn right I was, because it was listed in the yearbook. Karate Club, class of 87, Ted Alexandro, you can, you can find it. So I've been asked to do uh, these various shows outdoors. And my answer has always been a firm, no, thank you. I don't feel the need. I was talking with my friend, Russ Maneev, fellow comedian, co-founder of the New York Comedy Coalition, he and I, to get a, get a pay raise for comedians. Always one of my main guys. And I was, we were talking about how, like, I don't want to take gigs that replicate, like, the conditions of, like, the worst gigs I've done. Hey, do you want to do an outdoor gig where people are in their cars and they, fl they flash their headlights if they're laughing? No. I would have said no to that gig in 2001. <laughs> Why am I taking hell gigs? I've done enough of those over the years. Why would I take, hey, do you want to, we have a diner parking lot. There's a diner that's desperately trying to get people to buy their cheeseburgers. I'm not shitting on anyone who's taking these gigs. Have at it, go for it. I'm just telling you where I'm at, friends. It's a hard no. It's a hard no for me for many reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm retired. Secondly, I'm thinking of getting back into Shotokan. You know, if they have like an age group thing, you know, they do like, like with the, uh, the New York City Marathon, like they have, you can compete in your age group. If they have an age group for Shotokan, and if there is in fact a national tournament, and in, if, in fact, we can ever travel again safely. There's so many ifs to this story. But when the screenplay is written, it is going to be very much like the Karate Kid. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I'll have to track down Sensei Mike. The thing about Sensei Mike was he looked like uh, John Travolta in uh saturday saturday night fever but with like a with a with a clark gable mustache too i don't know if he was like so confident in his shotokan that he was like inviting confrontation you know like go ahead say something about my clark gable mustache i dare you um because he was like the oddest looking cat i've ever come across in 1987, not too, many, not too many people had Sensei Mike's look in 1987 or ever. It was a very singular look, you know, he, but it was a very versatile look too. He could have gone to the club. He could have, uh, you know, he could have been like an accountant. Uh, my whole, like, you know, you know how your mind is in two places? I was like, itch knee but i was also like what is what is sensei mike's deal you know you always like try to figure out your teacher's deal or your <laughs> you ever do that you just fantasize about what what does this guy what does sensei mike do in his off hours because he looks fascinating you know i need to know i need to know what what his deal is so yeah, I am, uh, I'm just not feeling, you know, maybe it's because I have the Ted Alexandro show. I have you viewers. 
And I will hop into the comments, I assure you. I just hope it's getting, it's percolating as it always does. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't feel a desperation to just, uh, yeah, you know what? We, uh, we have a mound of dirt and a bullhorn. You want, are you interested? No, no, I'm not. I did that gig in uh, 1996. Yeah, we're going to do, uh, we have, um, it's like, uh, you know, someone's backyard and we're not going to tell them that we booked a show. There's no sound system. Uh, and it's at 2 a.m. Are you in? You know, that, that actually doesn't sound bad. That sounds like a good story. Some gigs, and young comics write this down, some gigs you take for the story. But when you've accumulated enough stories, it better be damn good. And for me, you know, 26, 28 years, depending on when you start counting, 28 years in the biz, the story better be good to lure me in, you know? Parking lot, not going to do it. In the, <coughs> in the midst of a pandemic, I need more. I need more. So, you know, I get why, I get why younger comp, I'm a, I'm a 51-year-old retired comedian, married, with a young baby boy. You really think a parking lot is going to get a parking lot? You think I need to see people's headlights flashing? Come on. <laughs> Come on. I would encourage people. Here's here's my set. Run this before the show on the on the big screen. Turn your cars off and save your lights. You're draining your battery. I know I'm funny. Don't flash your lights. It's an unnecessary drain. We're in a pandemic. You probably haven't, a lot of you haven't used your car a whole lot. Nevertheless, I don't need your reassurance. I'm just here for the story. That's what I would say. And cut. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm saying no, I'm still in the no camp. You know, I don't want to be like the Miami Marlins of comedy. Like, oh, did you hear Ted? He took a, how embarrassing would that be? Yeah, he took a he took a gig on top of a dumpster, you know, and uh, behind a McDonald's. It was like a fun thing we were doing. And uh, now he has COVID. Doesn't he have a kid? Yeah. Why did he take the gig? Nobody knows. You know, there's a very thin line between love, you know, love of the craft, which we should all have. And that's a bad idea. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at, folks. You know, I'm not taking these gigs. I mean, I'm open to, you know, look, the right offer, of course. I have a family. <laughs> I have a family to provide for. So, you know, what is the, the parking lot? Uh, what, is, what is that? What is the offer? What is the firm offer? See, but with comedy, the thing is, like, there's always 10 comedians lined up behind you that they'll, they'll pay to do the gig. Not necessarily, but, the, you know, a lot of these gigs are like, oh, yeah, here's, uh, here's 10 bucks so that, you know, you can take a loss on the gig, but not as badly. Anyway, I'm not feeling it, folks. I feel as though the world should be on pause. The world should be on pause. As, as Sensei Mike used to say to us, sometimes you need to put the world on pause and block would-be would -be gigs. Block them. Block it, and then, if need be, throw a punch to the, to the, to the gut of whoever's offering. I never would. I'm a pacifist. I, I, I try to make that clear. But, you know, I also, you just want people to know that you took a semester of Shotokan. I don't wear it on my sleeve, but I want people, you know, to have that sense. So uh, here we are. Here we are, folks. JD, yes, welcome. 
<laughs> What's the universe got for us today? That is always the question these days. Always the question. This is all I have left. <laughs> Retired comedian Ted Alexandro. Yes. Put that on, put that on a t-shirt. I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. That now we're getting so. I think Sensei Mike might have said that at some point, now that I think back. But I was thinking back to uh I had this. I told my wife, my wife, my life is flashing before my eyes, but in drips. You know how they say, like when you when you're about to die, like your whole life. My life has been flashing before my eyes. I had uh, a, a, a recollection of a gig that I did. I couldn't have told you this, but I looked it up in uh, July of 2007. My, my mind just in the middle of the day today, I guess maybe because of the weather and maybe because of the offers of these other outdoor gigs, my mind flashed to July 2007, where I did an outdoor gig but it was a prestigious one, mind you. It was uh, Comedy Central put together for a summer stage in Central Park. They put together a comedy, uh, a series of, of comedy shows hosted by Dave Attell. So I, I looked it up and these are the people that I was on with. I, remem I remembered a couple of them. I didn't remember all of them. This was, I believe the gig was July 7th, July 6th, Friday, July 6th, 2007, 13 years, a little over 13 years ago. And the lineup, it was hosted by David Tell for Comedy Central. And the, the rest of the lineup was John Mulaney, Amy Schumer, Joe DeRosa, Kurt Metzger, and yours truly, Ted Alexandro. I love all those people and have done many gigs with them over the years. Uh, but that was, like a, that was like a fun, memorable night. It was like thousands of people on, I don't think it was the main lawn of Central Park, but it was a lawn. And it was, it was big, it was, uh, it was hot, and it was fun. It was hosted by Dave Attell, who's the best. You know, everybody loves Dave. He's just the, uh, the wizard. So, uh, yeah, my mind, my mind flashed back. And gosh, I, want, I think to myself, how many of these gigs do I have over the years? How many gigs <laughs> do I have that I completely, I completely forget, you know, until it just pops into my head like, oh, yeah, Central Park, summer stage. I was in front of thousands of people with all these other great comedians. So many of these types of gigs. And that's on like the big, you know, it was televised, it was taped for, for Comedy Central. So that's on like the prestigious, bigger side of things in Central Park. And then you have a million of the, the kind of gigs that I mentioned earlier, where you're on a, you're on a dumpster in, <laughs> At a college or something like that, you know? I remember some outdoor shitty college gigs, man. Wow, yeah. You, like, you're in the quad. It's an outdoor, you know, they put up like a makeshift three-foot riser and people are just walking by you. You're like, hey, you know? It's like they want you to do like guerrilla comedy and the head of the student activities committee is like, sorry, uh, you know, we, we told everybody about it. It's like, well, maybe you could have like... Um, set up some chairs <laughs> maybe um you know like a tent would have uh been a good idea you know just so like people aren't like wondering why this 40 year old guy is is talking to them as they're on their way to a party so these were, these were the things that were popping into my head these, uh, these past couple of days as I was getting offers to do gigs. Right now, well, first of all, I'm retired and I wish they would respect that. But secondly, 
uh, it's, it's a firm no at this point. It's a firm no. We're still in the midst of a pandemic, obviously, though some people are denying that and living as if, right? Maybe it's like a, you know how self-help tells you like, you know, dress for the job you have, the dre- <laughs> no, dress for the job that you want. Um, so maybe these people are just, they're dressing for the end of the pandemic. You know, they're, they're not wearing the mask. Just dress as if there is no pandemic. And I guess, you know, I, who am I to say? <laughs> it's a bit absurd if you ask me. But here we are again in, in, in end of July. And I was thinking back to the beginning. Do you remember, for me, the pandemic struck in earnest when Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson came down with it, right? Do you remember? I looked it up. It was March 11th or 12th. I don't know if it was like reported on the 12th, but they got it on the 11th, whatever it was. But I was thinking like that was like this generation's JFK moment. Where were you when you found out that Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson had contracted the coronavirus? I'll never forget. I was, I was home in Astoria because I was already quarantining. So, I mean, <laughs> that's the answer for, do you remember where you were? Yeah, I was home. Do you remember where you were in May of 2020? I was, I was in Astoria. I was home with my wife and son. But I do remember finding out that Tom Hanks, American icon, and his wife, Rita Wilson, also an actor, had come down with the coronavirus. They were in Australia for, a, I think, a film. And part of, do you ever have like the conspiracy theory brain? I was like, even if Tom Hanks doesn't have it, it's a brilliant move. They want us to believe. And who better to strike at the hearts of all Americans and all human beings everywhere, you know, than to find out that the beloved icon, Tom Hanks, has been diagnosed with, I don't even think we called it COVID-19 then. Right? Do you remember the innocent days when it was still just the coronavirus? And that day, if you remember, it was like a a triple dose because you had Tom Hanks, Rita Wilson, and then Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz who uh, came down with it and had very cavalierly, despite playing for the Jazz, uh, he was very cavalier and like touching the microphones at a uh, at a press conference because he was making light of the fact that this you know this coronavirus that everyone was talking about, and then like 24 hours, 48 hours later, Rudy Gobert had it, and his teammate, All Star Donovan Mitchell, because it's funny too, like that's that's the way the stories are reported. It's like Tom Hanks and his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Rita Wilson apparently has it too. Um, and then Rudy Gobert. But wait, all-star Donovan Mitchell. You know, like this shit is serious. But I remember that was when we as a nation, and certainly I as an individual, began to say like maybe this, you know, if Tom Hanks has it, let's shut shit down. And I was thinking like, Maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's come to this since he's fine. He's fine. We know he's fine. Maybe we should, maybe this should have happened months ago, but maybe we should name it the Tom Hanks disease just because again, it comes with a, like you pay attention 
if it's called the Tom Hanks disease, COVID-19, whatever, it's a little too scientific for people, the coronavirus, like different strains of this and that, um, the Tom Hanks disease, then you're like, whoa, I remember where I was when I, when I heard that he had it. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's a certain gravitas to it. And uh, we can all, you know, it's like Lou Gehrig's disease. You know, uh, Lou Gehrig, a former Yankee, I think, uh, you know, has, has a disease named after him. It's, uh, is it ALDS? Matthew, is that, is that right? I believe that's the American League Divisional Series. <laughs> that should be named after Lou Gehrig as well, if not Tom Hanks. Uh, A- ALS. ALS. <laughs> My apologies. All right, it's uh, it's still base. I'm still in in I'm still in the baseball realm. I think that's uh, that's allowable. So yes, ALS uh, was named for. Lou Gehrig, who famously gave that speech where he graciously said, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth, as he was exiting the sport that he so contributed to. So I think, you know, why not? Why not have, call this the Tom Hanks disease? He's fine. He's fine. He's going to keep making movies. He's in Australia making a movie now. But it just like maybe, you know, he's a hopeful guy. You know, he's, he's very positive. It, it kind of takes a little bit of the edge off the pandemic. It's still the Tom Hanks disease. So there's, there is that element of, you know, take it seriously. But, you know, pop in uh, Splash. <laughs> uh, and the Yankees, you know, the Yankees are this franchise that they have things named after them, medically speaking. Uh, as I mentioned, Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, that's a, that's a big one. That's a big achievement off the diamond forever known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Tommy John, former Yankees pitcher, uh, very famously, uh, has a surgery named after him that many pitchers to this day, I believe it's the ulnar nerve of their pitching elbow. He was a Southpaw. So to this day, many pitchers have this procedure done where the ulnar nerve, I believe it's the ulnar nerve. I always hear about (laughs) the ulnar nerve. Uh, And it's named for for Yankee pitcher Tommy John. And in a way, I was thinking it was a shame that Derek Jeter did not come down with, uh, strictly in terms of the, the, the bit, (laughs) <laughs> I don't wish ill on Derek Jeter, obviously, but had he contracted the coronavirus, you know, had he been the first rather than Tom Hanks, Rita Wilson and Rudy Gobert, the first, what am I saying? Celebrities, right? I, I'm, I don't, normal people don't matter in the, in the landscape of, of public awareness, the zeitgeist. We're talking about has it hit celebrities yet? But had it been Derek Jeter, who first came down with it, that just would have been a nice trifecta for the Yankees organization. We've got Lou Gehrig's disease. We've got uh, Tommy John surgery. And now we've got a pandemic, the Derek Jeter disease or the Derek Jeter virus, I think maybe more appropriately. And he is the part owner or president of the, uh, the Miami Marlins. So we, we just missed it by, we just missed it by about six months, you know, Jeter could, could have really, it would have been nice to have, you know, is it too late? I guess cause he doesn't have it, but his whole team does. I'm going to start a change.org petition. Look for the link in my, my Twitter timeline. So the pandemic rolls on folks and people are saying, uh, you know, we got to get back to school again. Look, teachers, teachers, what is it? Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be teachers. As a retired teacher, 
as well as a retired comedian. You could not pay me enough to go back into a classroom right now. Like, I don't understand. Like, teachers are, are already, like, disrespected. Nobody gives a shit about teachers. We pay constant lip service to, like, children are the future. And now we're like, get back in the classroom. We don't care. We'll put a couple of uh, pumps of, of Purell when you enter the, the building or the classroom. But, uh, you know, we're tired of having the kids home. I would not. That would be, you know, and we've seen teachers striking over the past couple of years all around the country. Man, I would love to see. I would show up. It would, I, it would be like a reenactment of, of, uh, of 1776. I would show up with my recorder. I'd, I'd wrap my head with the, uh, the gauze. And I would say, th these are the battle lines. They've been drawn. Uh, we are not returning to the classroom. And like, I would have like uh, the gym teacher playing the drums, you know? And, uh, and maybe Sensei Mike, just to, you know, to make sure no shit goes down. That I, I can play my solo in peace. I would not return to the classroom. The recorder is certainly not that important and nothing is, nothing is. Why can't we get this through our heads as a culture? Shit needs to stop. <laughs> it needs to stop and pay people whatever they were supposed to make. You know, the way you, you bailed out corporations and, and Wall Street, you know, the way you paid them trillions of dollars? Do the same with the teachers. Do the same with the small businesses. Do the same for all recorder teachers. That's right. I haven't forgotten where I came from. I will be on the... If there is a strike, mark my words, I'm, I'm kind of pining for a little... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pining to roll up my sleeves or um, my gi. Maybe I'll wear my gi. I'll combine my, my former lives... I'll show up in my gi, gauze wrapped around, you know, to, to, to reenact the, um, whatever that was, the American Revolution. <laughs> and I will lead the charge. I will lead the charge. You know, talk about a ragtag bunch. I on the recorder, the gym teacher, I think Stu. I taught with somebody named Stu, who was a gym teacher. Stu on the drums. Stu was a good guy. Because when you're a teacher and you're a comedian at night, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want anyone knowing. You keep that shit a secret. It's a very Clark Kent, Superman existence when you're a teacher who does stand up at night. But Stu was someone I could confide in. Stu knew my secrets. And didn't tell. And he was fascinated. He was like, you're doing the right thing. Get the fuck out of here, man. Stu knew. That's why I want him on the drums when, when, when the shit hits the fan. I, it's going to be me on the recorder. And just the visual is going to fuck people up. I'm in a gi. Why? Wearing a white belt with one. I think I got one black stripe. You know how you... Like before you get the next, I didn't get to yellow, but I got one, I got like one, I don't even know what it means. I think it just means like, you know, you've, you know, we recognize you've been, you've been coming. They, they put a thing of black tape on my white, I was a white belt with, with one ring of, of black tape. So I, I will show up if the teachers strike and I pray they do, do not, do not go back. Teachers, please. I've talked about this before. The next audacious act. If the teachers say, fuck no, we're not going. I will show up in my gi, white belt, one black ringlet around, around my white belt, playing the recorder. They're like, what the, what the fuck is going on? Like, who is that guy? I'm soloing. Stu is on the drums. Just keeping the beat. 
that Stu was that kind of guy. He would just keep the beat. And then Sensei Mike, just to make sure that, you know, nobody tries to step to us. I can see this happening. And I hope that it does. I hope, you know, it's really dependent. I'm there to support the teachers. I, I don't even, actually, I don't need to be in the front. I don't want to be. It's not right that I would be in the front lines. I can be towards the back. But I think, it, I think it would be wise to have Sensei Mike up towards the front. Because if the cops get involved, or the, worse, the feds, unmarked vans, they're going to grab the guy in the gi first. That's a visual, you know, they're like, this guy is trouble. Let's get him out of here. You know, and I'm willing to run interference. I'm willing to be that guy. I throw the recorder to Sensei Mike. I'm like, take me. You know, I'm, I'm here. I submit. Or do I? Maybe I, maybe it kicks in and they get a white belt with a single black ring's worth of ass kicking. That's not a threat. It's just one scenario that could come up. Well, my friends, all of that is to say I wish the teachers well. I was a teacher for five years even more than that, six, I think. I taught gym for one year. I taught music for five. The recorder. Those of you who are familiar with my, my comedy routines from the late 90s, early 2000s. So I wish my, my comrades, my fellow teachers well. And I, I hope they do not take any shit. And I hope that everyone stays safe first and foremost. My friends, I should have said this earlier. I'm sure Matthew will take me to task, as he often does. <laughs> but I encourage you to text me later in the show. I will be reading your texts. That's right. You, on your phone, can reach me on mine. And that number is 909-575-0789. Once again, that number is 909 909- Five seven five zero seven three seven. That will be happening a little bit later in the show. I will read your texts. Uh, and I remind you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not already, uh, just below what you're watching. Subscribe and hit the bell for notifications, my friends, so you can stay up to date on all things. Ted Alexandro show. Oh, yes. That JD, you are right on the money. We do have a budget. Thanks to our Patreon patrons. Uh, I, I do have a budget and we picture in picture is, is a reality. So there are, uh, there's, there's a lot going on uh, here at the, here at the studio. And uh, that is all thanks to our, our patrons. And now is perhaps a good time to mention that. Thank you so much to all the folks, all the good folks, all the kind folks who have been uh, subscribing and becoming members, patrons of the show at patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. That's right, folks. You too can help uh, us to realize all that we are doing here at the Ted Alexandro show. Uh, there are two levels with many valuable prizes uh, for you, awaiting you, there's the I did it level, which is the $5 level, and you will get early access to my new special cut up. You get one Zoom AMA with me. The next one is coming up on the third Wednesday of August. We already had the first one, and that was fantastic. You get discounts on merch, you get new member shout outs. Uh, and then, of course, at the $20 tier, the as much as you want level. Uh, you get the exclusive access to the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy. As I mentioned, I used to be a stand-up comedian of some note. I am doing an ongoing comedy academy uh, where I will be talking about the writing process. I'll be talking about finding your voice, using your body, 
facial expressions. I'd be doing a deep dive into uh, different styles of comedy, um, how to uh, kind of how to kind of root yourself in a practice, you know, because like with any artistic endeavor, you're going to want to uh, form a discipline, a practice, much like Shotokan. And you will move up the levels of stand-up as the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy progresses. There is one episode up. Uh, the first episode of, of the Comedy Academy, the first class, if you will, has been posted for the $20 members at patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. And that will be ongoing. There will be another class posted uh, in August, uh, perhaps two, uh, but that will be, as I said, ongoing. Um, and there, there will be probably upwards of uh, 10 classes minimum. And of course uh, you also get everything that the $5 level gets at the $20 level. So if you would, folks, if you enjoy what we've been doing, this is episode seven of the Ted Alexandro show. We could not do it without you, nor would we want to. And we appreciate all those who have already become patrons. That is patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. Yes, indeed, my friends. I wanted to, uh, and again, I will be taking your texts. That's 909. I see a few of them have come in already. Excellent. <laughs> yes, indeed, friends. We will be getting to your texts at 909-575-0737. I wanted to uh, just briefly mention something. I'm not picking a fight, okay? I'm a pacifist. I try to de-escalate whenever possible. But I noticed on Twitter today that uh, David Lynch, the noted director, creator of Twin Peaks, many other films, uh, Blue Velvet, practitioner of transcendental meditation, I believe. David Lynch was trending on Twitter for uh, a series of, of weather-related tweets and videos. Apparently he's been discussing the weather. I don't know if it's on a daily basis or, you know, every few days, but he's based in LA and he's been doing a series of weather related tweets and videos. And I, I it kind of got my dander up because those of you who follow me on Twitter, and again, I'm not calling out David Lynch. I'm sure it was just parallel thinking. I'm not starting like an East Coast, West Coast battle. He has my respect. I'm merely pointing out that I've been, I've been doing an ongoing series of weather-related tweets in an effort to appeal to a broader demographic. And this has been going on for several weeks. I, you know, I don't know how long, Dave, to be fair, I don't know how long David Lynch has been doing this. I've been doing a series of weather related tweets. Is that, is that, Matthew, is that a decent David Lynch? You're, you're a Lynch head. Surprisingly good. <laughs> that is, uh, that I'm going to take, that is like the highest compliment that, that you could give me. Um, so, yeah. So, for instance, here's, here's a recent weather related tweet of mine. Hot day, a hot July day in New York City will give way to nighttime lightning and eventually rain post midnight. Should cool things down for a few days, and I, for one, welcome it. You know, I think it makes me more relatable. Uh, you know, I know that uh, oftentimes I can be a little heavy, um, and I'm fine with that, by the way, but I like to, you know, almost like a storm that, that, that breaks the humidity. These weather-related tweets serve that purpose for me, and I always parenthetically uh, let the let, let the reader know uh, latest in an ongoing series of weather-related tweets intended to appeal to a broader demographic. So I'm I'm completely transparent about it. You know, I have it's it's not like I'm trying to do it on the sly. I I state the the objective of the, of the tweet follows the tweet. 
I've done a series of these. I don't know if it's half a dozen. All of that ilk, you know, interesting. You wonder what, what, why is he doing this? That, that is answered shortly after you have that thought. If you keep, if you read to the conclusion of, of the tweet. Uh, but I find that it has really brought, it has served the purpose. It's broadened my appeal. Uh, it gives me permission to show that weather related side of myself that we all have. I'm not claiming to be any different, but you know, until I started this series, this ongoing series of weather related tweets, I had no idea how, how important it, it would be and how liberating in a certain sense it would be to tweet about the weather. And I know that often like weather chat is derided as being, you know, unnecessary small talk. How's the weather? Just something to break the ice. But for me, it's been so much more than that. It's been an opportunity to connect with the Twitterverse on a level that uh, I hadn't prior. And again, I, my, my motives, my objectives are completely transparent. Uh, I'm not, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to leave any, any, any conjecture, any room for conjecture or doubt as to my motives are, are, are pure and I state them. Now, David Lynch, I, I don't know what his motives are. If he's just trying to be quirky, you know, as David Lynch is wont to do. Um, and that's his right. That's, you know, and I think that's authentically who he is. But it, 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 you know, I was a little miffed that he, that he was trending for his weather-related tweets when I've had this ongoing series. And, um, you know, it's, it's gotten some good traction, some really nice feedback, you know, people really interacting with it, people, you know, chiming in. And again, hop into the comments on YouTube if you haven't already. I see there, I see that they're, ah, uh, yes, yes, I see that they're heating up. Um, so yeah, I'm not picking a fight with David Lynch. Again, I all do respect and, uh, I love his work, but, uh, you know, he's not the only one doing weather related tweets and, uh, in an ongoing series, you know, granted mine have not had the video component thus far, but maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll do one that does. Um, so, you know, again, uh, this is we don't have a beef. I want to make that clear, uh, but I was I was a little bit taken aback that he was getting such a claim that he was trending for his weather related tweets. When I've been, you know, m check my timeline, go back, go back, comb through, do a search weather related, do a, you know, put it in quotes. I think you'll see that my weather related tweets. Uh, have been ongoing and they speak for themselves. So, you know, I wish David, David w well with his series. And as often happens in show, I've had this happen as a comedian too, where, you know, I, I do a joke and a, a bigger name comedian has a similar joke. And sometimes all you can do is just say like, look, the bigger name is going to win. I'm, you know, I, how am I going to, I mean, I do have the receipts, as they say. Check my timeline. Maybe that's, maybe that's the next phase of this, As I check his. I see how far back his weather-related tweets go. And maybe, you know, the world has enough conflict. Maybe we can collaborate on a project of, uh, of weather-related tweets. I, as I said, I'm a fan. I have the utmost respect for his work. I think there is room for a collaboration down the line when things have settled down it's still a little bit raw today because i just i just found out pop culture graveyard <laughs> shoto comedy <laughs> yes indeed everybody should be following pop culture graveyard talk about a great series of uh just music culture uh videos by hollis james nobody is more equipped than he to discuss all things pop culture so subscribe to Pop Culture Graveyard. Shoto Comedy, yes. Uh, maybe I'll coin that. That's the subscribe sound. Or an angel is getting his or her wings. Uh, Chris Green, love David Lynch movies. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. You know who would know a hell of a lot about him? Hollis James. Hollis James knows his, his pop culture, all things pop culture. And 
quite honestly. Uh, producer extraordinaire Matthew L. Weiss. Um, oh, yeah. Can you name... Uh, I'm going to ask you to, on the spot, and I hope you haven't Googled it. Can you name five David Lynch movies? My hand's off the Google. Eraserhead, Dune, Blue Velvet, Wild at Heart, Mulholland Drive. I'll name them all. Uh, <laughs> Lost Highway. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, uh, I remember seeing Blue Velvet. Inland Empire. Blue Velvet's the, the one, if you can only see one. Yeah, but he yeah. did, yeah, The Elephant Man. Right. Yeah, I, I remember. And Twin Peaks, uh, of course. Yes, the movie Twin Peaks. I remember uh, seeing, thank you, Matthew. I remember seeing uh, Blue Velvet in the theater and I was not equipped. I think I was like 15 or 16 maybe. And I saw it with a, a bunch of like neighborhood friends and like, we just kind of laughed our way through it. I, I have to watch that again as hopefully a mature uh, adult. Uh, but I remember seeing it, you know, since obviously on um, like just, you know, catching it like halfway through in a hotel, uh, you know, tell on a hotel television and loving it. But I just remember <laughs> you ever think back at times, things like that, where you're like, shit, man, I was, I was such a dummy, you know, like, I remember we just like, we goofed our whole way through it. Like, like uh, Beavis and Butthead or something. Um. Uh, David Lynch lives part-time in Madison, Wisconsin. Is that true, Chris? That makes sense. Madison is like an interesting town. I've, I've enjoyed my time. I actually went to a Sarah Palin rally because I was headlining Comedy on State, which is the, the comedy club in Madison. And that's a real like radical town, labor town. Uh, so Sarah Palin was coming to speak, you know, whatever – when she was running with uh, McCain, right? In whatever year that was, was that 2008? So I just happened to be there. So I went with uh, the other comedians just as a lark, you know, we went to, uh, to watch Sarah Palin speak. And uh, it was like an amusing way to spend an afternoon. She's obviously, you know, she's charismatic if, if you share her politics, I guess, uh, telegenic. But yeah, it was kind of a, Look, when, I, when I'm on the road, if something like that is happening down the block, I'm there, you know, because like the alternative is to, to sit in your hotel doing nothing or, you know, pretend to, to go to the gym or something. So, yeah, like I went with the other comedians. We, we saw Sarah Palin and like the different factions, like the pro and the uh, con groups yelling and jeering as, as she spoke but it was a good memory in Lynch's defense. The weather in his world is probably vastly different than the weather in ours. That's a fair point. Yes. <laughs> I should do a weather video and call him out. Stand your ground. Thank you, JD. Yeah. You don't want to train to white belt black stripe for nothing. That's true. Yeah. But I, you know, I think to be fair, I think sensei Mike would discourage uh, any type of any type of uh conflict or confrontation you know it, uh, the, it's been a long time but my recollection was sensei mike was all about don't throw hands uh unless someone disrespects your lady as you might guess from his his hairdo his saturday night fever hairdo and his pencil mustache no he was all about like most of these martial art guys he was all about peace until it's time to go. I think that was, that was on the wall. Uh, Amy A. Jones weighs in. The straight story is my favorite. The straight story, that's a, uh, a David Lynch oh, movie. So good, yes. It's yeah. Lynch's G-rated movie. Lynch's G-rated movie. The one I forgot. Well, I should mention my, my weather tweets are G-rated they, for the whole family. So uh, I don't see why... I don't see why they're not trending and I don't see why uh, David Lynch has to be placed on a, a pedestal when, you know, th this, th these weather related tweets are my, the straight story. You know, you've got your, you know, if you know uh, my comedy, you know, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the shit, my pants story off my latest album cut up, 
You know the Kaepernick national anthem bit, perhaps. Uh, going back, you know the uh, throwing away salad. I'm just naming a few off the top of my head. Uh, but the, this, this, you know, nobody could really see this series of weather-related tweets coming. I don't think. I didn't. Uh, and it's, it's for the whole family, you know, let me, let me read that again, because I have, obviously I have a a seven month old son. I have nephews and nieces. I I, I would, I would have no compunction about reading this tweet in front of any of them. A hot July day in New York city will give way to nighttime lightning and eventually rain post midnight should cool things down for a few days. And I, for one, welcome it. That's for the whole family. That there, there is no, there's not a member in your family that you could not read that in front of and say like, hey, did you hear Ted Alexandro's most recent in a series of weather-related tweets? If you were to read that in front of grandma or a five-year-old child, both would perk up and say like, is that the forecast? You know, or where does he live? You know, obviously not everyone, uh, this is specific to where I live. But I would think that there would be a measure of just human curiosity, you know, and I would further the discussion in that family, this fictional family, wherever they are, perhaps I bring them together and they discuss the weather, you know, whatever has been going on locally. That's, you know, that's, that's my goal. That's, that's my goal, you know. Um, We'll see. We'll see. You know, I, I'm not stopping because I found out that David Lynch, let's put it that way. Lynch, if you thought I was stopping because you're doing this series, you are sorely mistaken. I am going to up my, I'm doubling down. I'm going to up my weather game in coming days and weeks. Again, this is not, it's not a, that's not a, you know, I don't meant that to be argumentative or combative, though I understand if it came across that way. Thank you. Thank you, JD. It is, I believe it. I believe it is, you know, I try to keep my weather tweets classy. I don't mind getting a little, uh, you know, going off road, as we say in, in the biz. I don't mind going off road. I'm equipped to go wherever need be. But these weather tweets, again, are my, the straight story. These are my attempt. You know, I want to show the industry all my colors. <laughs> um. So look for, you know, this is my way of saying, David Lynch, uh, kudos to you. Great idea. I don't know where you got it from. Uh, but, you know, keep, keep going with it. Let's see where it goes. And uh, history will judge both of our series of, of weather tweets. That's right. That could, be, that could be a live sound effect for all we know. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have been uh, weighing in on on my my Twitter feed on my weather tweets. Uh, so, folks, yes, patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. Please uh, become a member, a patron, and uh, help us to do the work that we are doing here at the Ted Alexandro Show. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the notifications. Subscribe on YouTube, please. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, my comedy is playing anywhere that you listen, Pandora, Spotify, etc. All of my albums, including my most recent, Cut Up, are streaming wherever you listen to your comedy. Now, friends, we are, uh, let's, let's shout out, let's actually shout out our patrons now. Uh, we're going to shout out uh we've got incoming patrons uh almost daily and as i as i said it 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 just it warms the heart especially on a night such as this when rain is in the forecast a summer night sure david lynch you can you can write a weather related tweet but can, can you then work it into a shout out for your patrons Maybe we can. I don't know. I'm going to say you probably can't. 
But we do thank our patrons, each and every one of you. We've been shouting you guys out every episode. Tonight is no different. Thank you, Jen Joyce Davis. Thank you, Andrew Pabone. Andrew, is it, it could be Pabon, but I'm going to say, I'm going to give it a little juice. Andrew Pabone. Matthew, can we uh, bring the music down slightly? Just because it is, it is a summer's eve. There we go. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Priscilla F. Thank you, Shannon Hilbert. Thank you, Rob Todd. That is a strong name. Both monosyllabic. That's a showbiz name. Thank you, Rob Todd. Thank you, Joan Moore. Also, two monosyllabs. Thank you, Jessica Drees. Much love. Thank you to Hillary Billingsley. That's a very mellifluous name. Thank you so much, Hillary Billingsley. Thank you, Merrick Weintraub. I like that. I've always liked the name Merrick and Weintraub, for that matter. The two together, perfection. Thank you, Merrick Weintraub. And thank you, Richard Baker. Sounds like a 70s slow jam producer produced by Richard Baker. Thank you, each and every one of you, for supporting the Ted Alexandro Show. Uh, We cannot thank you enough. As I said, it warms the heart every time that bell rings. And uh, you enable us to continue to do the fine work we are doing here at the Ted Alexandro Show. And those of you who have not yet, please visit patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. And we will shout you out from the bottom of our heart. All of us here at the Ted Alexandro Show. Thank you. All right, my friends. We are going to uh, check the texts now. The texts have been flowing in. I saw a couple of juicy ones come in. That number, of course. The, uh, the number to text me is 909 575 0737. That number again, 909-575-0737. Let's get to it. The first, oh, this is, uh, I love it already. Hey, Ted, it's the guy with the broken collarbone from a couple of weeks ago. Still waiting to have surgery but I'm trying to think of jobs I could do one-handed. Want to help me out and brainstorm some one-handed jobs? <laughs> Those of you who uh, have been watching all seven episodes of the Ted Alexandro Show, they're available on YouTube. Please do remember to subscribe, hit the notifications. This young man... Uh, graced us with the text just a couple of episodes ago, if I, if I recall. Maybe it was episode five. Maybe it was four. And he wrote us uh, explaining that in an effort to impress a young woman, uh, he was at the gym, I suppose, and, uh, and, and broke his collarbone. It was an ill-fated attempt to win the affections of a young woman. I talked him off the ledge. I told him, uh, you know, we've all been there. Not with a broken collarbone, but certainly with a broken heart. So your question here is one-handed jobs. The obvious aside, that doesn't pay well. One-handed jobs. Uh, Well, I mean, look. You could... you could do what I'm doing, you know, although I obviously I'm very facile with my gesticulations, both hands, but were I to suffer the fate that you did, were I to, I don't know whether it's your right or your left and further, whether you are a righty or a lefty, 
But if it's your dominant, uh, if it's your dominant collarbone, that would be a bit of a hindrance, would it not? You know, if I had, if my right collarbone, you know, and then I were in a sling, that that would be tough. You'd get a lot of shoulder gesturing. You know, and I'm not. It's not saying I couldn't do it. But clearly, I'm at my best. And this goes back to Sensei Mike, Shotokan, St. Francis Prep, senior year. A lot of, you know, a lot of what I do, if you're paying attention, is out of the Shotokan uh, method. You know, so there's a lot of hand gestures that I'm working in that, if you're paying attention, could be used as self-defense in an emergency. Uh, it informs what I do. So uh, could you do that with one hand? Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm giving you a little taste of it right now. And this is my, this is my non-dominant hand, you know, and those kind of gestures. If you watch, I encourage you to watch this back at slower speed and you'll see a lot of what I'm doing is uh, th there's a lyrical quality to it. There's a, almost a, a balletic, ballet-esque, whatever the word is you'll see the movements uh, take on a life of their own. Now, were I to be in a sling, uh, you know, and I'm not, I'm not belittling what befell you. I'm merely saying, you know, if, if that were to happen, you pick yourself up and you find a way, right? So you gesture and you work on your offhand, you know, just like if you're a basketball player, I think when, when Steph, Steph Curry had, a, had an injury to his shooting hand, he was getting up shots in the gym with his left. You, you know, you work, on the, you work on your offhand. Same with gesturing. The left hand isn't going to teach itself. You've got to, you know, you've got to work that. You've got to use it. So that's, that's one possibility for you. If you, you know, I don't, I don't know your interests. I don't know if uh, a live stream is up your alley or not. So, but certainly you could do this with no hands. <laughs> but the hands certainly bring a lot to the table. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with one hand these days. Uh, you know, like on the computer, right? Uh, you can still any type of um, IT word processing. <laughs> uh, you can input information with one hand. It, again, it'll be a bit of a hindrance. Um, but. You know, and yeah, anything that is more, you know, what you could do is get like a Stephen Hawking type uh, thing where you just, uh, you say like, G, I, F, T, you know, like you, you, you do, it's a voice command. You can do that. I don't know what your budget is for this one, this one handed job, but you know, there's a possibility if we think outside the box, maybe you, you Stephen Hawking your way to like a, a, a voice command. You, you don't need it either hand, you know, that opens up, that opens up a lot of possibilities. So look, it, it's your collarbone. It's not mine. I don't know where you're at in terms of, are you doing rehab? Uh, I can put you in touch with sensei Mike. Uh, I feel as though he's going to, give it the attention it needs. He's not going to baby it. I'll tell you that right off the bat, but he will get you back on your feet. He will get your collarbone where it needs to be. But more importantly, mentally, he's going to get you, uh, you know, in the right frame of mind to get back out there, get back to the gym. And once again, pursue the affections of whomever might catch your eye while gesturing with both hands. But for now, you know, there, just there's a lot of there's a lot of op opportunities and these days unless you're like lugging things onto a truck you know i don't know what what you did before before i don't think you mentioned it either here you're going to be having surgery wishing you well with your surgery obviously um but yeah you know unless you're doing like hard labor uh there's a lot you can do with one hand and obviously, again, I don't know if it's your dominant hand or your off hand, that affects things too. I'm going to need more information. So next week, <laughs> you can hit us with another text. And thank you for that. Wishing you well. Take good care of it. I don't know if you're much for gesturing, but 
you know, try to keep it as, as, as stationary as you can. That's my advice for now. Question. How did we never use sensei mic on teacher's lounge? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm guessing that's coming from Hollis James. Uh, that is, that is a good question. Look, we, we did 10 episodes of teacher's lounge. Uh, those of you watching, uh, all 10 of those episodes are on YouTube. You can look up teacher's lounge. Each one, uh, stars a comedian friend playing a different member of the faculty. Hollis James and I are, uh, the, uh, janitor and the music teacher respectively. But yeah, you know, uh, yeah, someone like Godfrey could have, could have been um, Sensei Mike. Uh, there's a lot of comedians, obviously, but Godfrey comes to mind as somebody who he's in that uh, he's in that MMA world, and based here in New York, he could have been a good Sensei Mike. <laughs> and Godfrey, of course, always makes me laugh. Uh Next question is, uh, did you rate your marriage this week? That is a, uh, an excellent question. I do, uh, you know, rate my marriage is something that I did on my prior podcast, A Little Bit Me. That was a, a recurring segment. You know, and my, my wife and I, uh, we've been we've been in a really nice groove, you know, I don't know if it's just this pandemic, like it feels like wartime conditions, you know, we've got the, we've got the seven month old, you know, and I feel like, uh, what was that Italian movie? Matthew, do you remember this? What was that Italian movie where the guy won the Academy award Benicio? Was it Benicio something? Yeah, uh, beautiful, beautiful, life something like that i didn't say it but yeah. i think it i think it might be life beautiful. is beautiful life, life is beautiful maybe that was it yeah. he yeah, climbed yeah. over the chairs during the ceremony that's right yeah. famously famously um i don't know why i'm saying benicio del toro it was something roberto very, benini roberto benini very that operatic type of mellif, mellifluous name roberto benini who, uh, as I as I recall, had been like a comedic actor in Italy for many years, and uh, of of some note, but then did this uh, film that took place during the Holocaust, and it was kind of that thing of like the juxtaposition of that time frame and him as the father to this young boy, trying to create a magical world for him. Uh, I'm not saying this is the Holocaust, clearly. What I'm saying is I, my wife and I, are, are creating a world here for our son. And he doesn't know <laughs> that if there's a pandemic, uh, he knows that we wear masks when we, go, when we go outside and we don't make direct eye contact with anyone. Um, but, you know, I give us, I give us an A, questioner. I give us an A for the simple fact that we are in a pandemic. We are in tight quarters in our apartment 90% of the time. Sure, we go for walks. We take our boy out. We show him, you know, we say that that sound is a bird, what you're hearing. And he lo I do a pigeon. I do a pigeon. You know, I don't like to reveal too much of my personal life. Uh, but I do an impression of a pigeon that the boy loves. He laughs and laughs. You would not, but, and he doesn't give it up. He's not an easy laugh. So when I find comedic gold, he, he, he just explodes. And, you know, I'll, I'll do the pigeon all day long, you know? Like Roberto Benini, if I can get my child through the war, that is the goal. So you know, in as a, as a in my stand up comedy days, would I revert to a sound effect? Sure, <laughs> uh, 
I will do whatever it takes, whether with an audience of thousands in Central Park in 2007 or an audience of one with my seven-month-old son. And I know the go-to. And then it's that fine line, though, because you, you finally find something, right? It's like, oh, yes. He loves the pigeon. But... You don't want to overuse. This is for new parents, young parents out there. You know, I don't know what your, 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 your parental experience is, the confluence of, of, of your, your parental experience and your comedy chops. You got to have comedy chops if you're a parent. So for my son, when I do the pigeon for him, oh, you know, he just loses it but you don't want to overuse it because if you, if you beat it into the ground and like I said, he's, he's got a short kind of like a low tolerance for repeating bits. So right now I'm, 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 I'm you know, I, I feel as though it, it, to be perfectly honest, I feel as though it, it, we're kind of, you know, I don't see it lasting beyond like the weekend. Cause already he's like, yeah, I, I like that bit. You know, he laughs, he laughs. He's like, yeah, but now it's more of a smile laugh. It's not like, it's not like it was earlier in the week where I was like, this is gold. You know, I say to my wife, we've, you know, this is, this is it. This is, we've got, we've got our closer, but I can see he's already, you know, losing interest a bit. So uh, yeah, we take him out for walks. Uh, we take him to the park, you know, uh, we'll get a coffee and, and we'll go to the park. Um, we like to, as much as possible, like, show him that there is a world beyond this apartment and he li he likes it considering the fact that he hasn't interacted with a lot of people like just today i took him for a walk and there's an older guy that lives a few doors down and uh he threw the guy a smile he threw him a smile and the guy was like you ever see like when old people like old people smile and it throws you off a little bit for a second because like they have that old stoicism you know, especially like older neighbors, there's like an old stoicism to them, you know, but the kid melts their hearts, you know? So it's like, I guess it's just like a ripple thing. I'm doing the pigeon for him. He's smiling for the old guy. It, it, it makes the world go round. This is what makes the world go round. And my wife has her bag of tricks, you know, she's an accomplished comedian in her own right. She's got some great stuff. You know, we work differently. That's all I'm saying. My wheelhouse is, is bird noises. <laughs> but again, I'm, I'm very, um, I share, like, I don't try to keep these things secret. I shared my technique with my wife. I told her it's like the tongue. You got to, you got to have that, you got to keep it loose. And then you throw in the, you know. And she caught on rather quickly. So now she can do it as well. You know, I don't, I'm not like uh, proprietary about, uh, you know, my, my, my sound effects. My weather related tweets, you know, I think there should be a line that we don't cross. So uh, to, answer your, to answer your question, uh, I, I give us an A, you know, and, and I, give, I give anyone, anyone who is in a relationship in a pandemic, let me say this. Anyone who's in a relationship in a pandemic and is making it work, good on you. I mean, th these are difficult conditions, right? As much as you love anyone, there comes a point where it's like, uh, could you maybe take a walk? I've heard those words directed in, uh, towards me. Why don't you take a walk? You know, And we have the baby as a buffer. Why don't you take the baby for a walk? But you know what you know what it's, you know what's being said, you know what's being said, and I get it. I get it. You know, I know how I can be from time to time. <laughs> uh, and anyone, you know, anyone, you, you just when you spend that much time together over a protracted period of time, you need some space. It's healthy. It's healthy, right? But in the early part of the pandemic, where do you go? There weren't that many options. Now, at least, you know, we're getting out. We're social distancing. Um, 
I'm still, uh, you know, we're a mask family. Make no mistake about it. We are a mask family, and we look down on those who do not wear. You know? What I'm saying when I say that is, we believe in science in this household. I don't know how that became a radical statement, but I've heard scientists, medical professionals, say that wearing a mask is a good idea. It prevents transmission. So I took that to mean wearing a mask is a good idea. (laughs) You know, where do you get the balls? Where do these people get the, where do you, like, how do you think that you know better than a scientist or, or someone in the, the medical field who has been in emergency rooms, in hospitals, has seen it with their own eyes and have said wearing a mask is, is one of the things you can do to prevent the spread. <laughs> and people are like, that may be true, but uh, I'm over it. I'm over it. So this is what we're, uh, this is what we're up against, folks. This is what we're up against. This is the world we're in. Can't wait till David Lynch begins rating his marriages. (laughs) Life is beautiful. Yes, that was life is beautiful. I think I have to rewatch that actually. Uh, The Roberto Benigni movie. Maybe I'll remake that shot, shot for shot but set against the pandemic. (laughs) When a retired comedian has to see his seven-month-old baby boy and his wife through the coronavirus pandemic, he turns to bird calls and the family stays together (laughs) and gets an A. So friends, We are wrapping things up for tonight. Um, as I said, we, uh, we have uh, the Ted Alexandro Show live streaming every Monday and Thursday, 7 p.m. right here on YouTube. Uh, please, if you have not already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the notifications. And if you would, visit patreon.com slash Alexandro to support the work all of us here at the show are doing to provide you with two live streams a week. And we do appreciate, as I said earlier, all those who have subscribed, become members, become patrons. There are two levels, the $5 level and the $20 level at patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. Thank you so much, friends, for spending part of this summer night with us. Until next time, stay well, stay centered, and we will see you Monday, 7 p.m., right here on YouTube, The Ted Alexandro Show. Good night, friends.